Dear Heavenly Father, um, Lord, we just thank you for yet another opportunity to come together and to, to study these divine things that you've given to us, Lord. I pray that each one here will have a greater understanding of uh, the points that are being touched in this lesson. And Lord, I just pray that in regards to the conversations that we all want and feel like we need to have in regards to some of the message that is coming out. Lord, I pray at this time that you give us an extra blessing of patience, Lord, because we really need it. And I pray that you'll help us to hum be humbled, Lord, um, to be mindful of humbling ourselves so that we do not have to be humbled in the end by you. And that we'll recognize, Lord, that there are many things that we still don't know, and there are many things that we need to let go of. And I, I trust, Lord, in each, that each one of the people that are here right now, they don't want to hold on to anything that is going to keep them from you. But, Lord, we are stubborn, and we are stuck in our ways, and we really need your guidance and the light that comes from heaven to guide our path, Lord, so that we ourselves will let go of all the things that keep us from coming closer to you. Lord, I pray that your spirit would be here with us right now to give us uh, discernment in regards to this message and understanding. And I pray, Lord, that you will help me to present it properly. I pray that the equipment would all work properly. I pray my internet will hold up. Mm -hmm. And Lord, I pray for each one here. And I pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. Mute a good part of the time. I have visiting dogs. Okay. All right, so I don't know if I have this all sorted out in my head, but hopefully it'll come out, come out all right. So this one is on King of the North and King of the South compared and contrasted. Um, there's a little bit of review in the beginning and, and then it starts getting into um, a real focus on the King of the South because the King of the South has been seemingly ignored as we focused on the King of the North. And so we're gonna progress into that mindset. Um, so the beginning, like I said, is review. It's gonna probably be very familiar and the same, kind of, kind of like the same old, same old, but it's all for a purpose, so. All right. So, and I'm just gonna read the notes the way they are, because I didn't get time to really get this in my head very well. I just want to review the conclusion we came to yesterday regarding our fifth line that we take, um, the fifth line, we take the 144,000 and it's our template and that we would talk about. So we have 1989, 9-11, Sunday Law, Close of Probation, and set to move the camera over, and Second Advent. And that's our template. So we bring it down to the reform line of the priest and what I've done is instead of moving it across, we'll just bring it directly underneath. Um, oh, and the loud cry. I missed the loud cry up there. So we bring it directly underneath. This is the way that some people like to draw the reform lines. People like to draw the reform lines in different ways, depending on what makes it easier for, for it to stay in their mind. So with the priest line, oh, I forgot to put all that in. Harvest. Uh, I lost myself already. <clears throat> Okay, so with the priest line, we have 1989, 9-11, Sunday Law, uh, 2018, 2019, and Paneum. And remember what we started by trying to understand, we have Raphia and Paneum and Sunday Law. Um, and when we call Raphia Midnight and Paneum Midnight Cry, who's being cried to and who is the message for? The institution. Yes. So we come to the Levites and we move it, we move it one across. Um, yeah. So 9-11 is their time at the end. 2014, 2019, their loud cry, Paneum, and then Sunday Law. And... So Paneum goes from a second advent to a close of probation. And for the Nethanums, we move it across one more. And we have 2014 as their time in the end. We have 2019. We have Paneum, a loud cry, Sunday law, and a close of probation. 
So in your video too, she put the loud cry between Rafi and Panyam for the Levites, right? Right. Between, yeah. So it was before their harvest. Okay. So, it, so I don't think it was a mistake that she made like a, a mouth blunder. I think it's changed back to the, their loud cry being before their harvest. Was she, so she was, did she start to say it was over <clears throat> here for a little while and then moved it back? Because I didn't really catch that. Um, I think that's what was happening in the Brazil videos because remember we were wondering who is the loud cry for in the time of the 144,000 if the loud cry for the Nethanims is before Sunday Law. Now you have a loud cry for the 144,000 after Sunday Law. Who is it for? And there was that whole hullabaloo and I ended up emailing her and I'm pretty sure she said something to the effect of that their loud cry is during their harvest for the Nethanims and the Levites. So. I don't know if it's changed back or not. Sunday law. Yeah, but um, I don't think that's what it is anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, it, if it all goes off the model of great controversy, you have the Sunday law, then you have the loud cry, then you have the close of probation. And if I understood correctly, if anything has changed, I don't know, but I know there's still confusion on that. But when it comes to the line of the priests, ours is before because our harvest is not progressive. Their harvest is progressive and takes place during their loud cry. She she didn't do that in video six or video seven, it seems. Yeah. So I think it might have changed. I'll go back and watch it. Have you emailed her and asked her about that? No, I could. I mean, She's always nice to answer me. So. <laughs> Um, maybe we could find out why, because because it's it's based off the model of the great controversy. Well, that's the thing is that um, the one hundred and forty four thousand, I think, is because they are a fourth group, so they have to have their own loud cry. So, who they are, we don't know anymore. Once again, I think. <laughs> I don't know if the next thing she says here makes sense to what you guys are talking or not, but she says. So after she just did the nath and the line, she said, so Pinium can be a second advent, a closer probation, or a Sunday law. But whenever we come to a midnight cry or loud cry, it, it's this small way mark in between that leads to a closer probation. Yeah. Um, and she said, can we see that? I'm, I'm still a bit confused as to when you guys are talking about that. I, my brain's just not getting it. Um, but no biggie. Yeah, well, because on your nath and M line there, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm, maybe, I don't know, because on your Nethanim line there, their close of probation is the close of probation for the world, and their harvest is in the world, is, is between Sunday law and close of probation. But she's calling that the close of probation, but isn't their close of probation um, right, right here? No, that's, that's not, for the Levites. That's for the Levites. Oh, oh, it's because it didn't shift, that's right. That messes it up a little bit. She she shifted yeah, them find, backwards find, a lot. Yeah, so it's kind of confusing. So you're right. So that would be over there. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like doing it this way. <laughs> I, find it I don't either. I'm used to the other way, but, <laughs> but it anyway, must help someone. Yeah. Maybe it helps someone. Yeah. Okay. So uh, so when we see the pinium as a midnight cry. I don't know what she's talking about here. Panium is a midnight cry. Where do we see that? On the ship line. Oh, okay. That, that's the only place, remember? The fifth line. Oh, this line, yeah. Okay. So when we see Panium, I didn't get a chance in my notes to put where my slide changes happen, so that's really going to mess me up. <laughs> uh, so it was midnight cry. This was was the line that we did with... Um, that we did with the Acts 27 and the ship. When we looked at the ship in the first... Uh, when we looked at the ship, the first line began in 1989, but if we see the whole story of that ship, where does it begin? In 1798. When we come to the story of the se of story from 1798, that's about the ship. And what did the ship represent? The United States and Adventism. When we, tr when we traced its journey from 1798, we could do it through 1844, 1863, 1989, we traced this journey and then we found the following pattern. We had 9-11 to Sunday law and between 9-11 and Sunday law, we have two way marks. 
And these waymarks have have the characteristic of an increase of knowledge and an angel comes down at midnight, which I found that confusing. I didn't, I don't understand the angel coming down at midnight, but this is the fifth line. So does anyone have any idea what she's talking about there? Cause I thought the angel came down here. Um, so at midnight, in, while Paul was in the midst of the people at midnight, there was an angel who came to him and told him that oh. the people need to stay on the ship and they're going to shipwreck on an island and everyone's going to be fine. That's right. Okay. Yeah, it was that in uh, Acts 27. Okay, so the angel comes down at midnight and then we have a midnight cry. And this midnight cry has all the characteristics of an exeter. So we have our Boston, our Concord on the fifth line. And if we have two way marks in between 9-11 and Sunday law, and we see Sunday law as a shut door for the ship, uh, it's a closer probation also. So that's also getting a little more complex, closer probation at the end of Sunday law. And I guess closer probation at Sunday law, is that, that's what she's talking about. And, if, uh, and it makes Raffi and Panium midnight and midnight cry. Um, but it's a midnight and a midnight cry for these two institutions right here. And that's because it's their close of probation at Sunday law. So it's a Sunday law, right. but it's close of probation for the institutions. And okay, so one part about the institutions that is really confusing me is if all the people are accounted for in the other four lines, is this talking about a collective? Like it's it's not the building, not the organization. We're we're, we're talking about institutions here. So what is this talking about? Because a change in leadership. No, um, so in leadership. I don't think I don't know that that's what it is because she made the example. She said Israel back in their time, you had Israel getting taken into captivity and being punished, and you also had the land getting punished. Right, but there is a change in leadership in the United States, and also a change, they're going to have to acknowledge a change in leadership in the Seventh Day Adventist Church. So, yeah, but is that what the institution is talking about? Because it starts in 1798, and she made the point that no people are alive that long. This is purely for the institutions. Right, right. I don't know what. what but then, what, how, how can you say it's for the institution? What is it? The building, the church building, is getting a, a warning message from an angel. I think it's the system, um, yeah, the system of uh, understanding, because you, you have like, um, I think it's like when you have s communism in Russia, right? You have a system of a political system that's guiding and leading everyone, and everyone has to act a certain way because of that specific political system. But when communism falls, People are still there, but they don't have anything organizing them under a political system. They have to reorganize under some new system. Do you see what I'm saying? Change in leadership. Like I understand, I'm, the problem I'm having is if the, every individual in the world falls under those first four lines. So people fall under those first four lines, but this is talking more about them as a collective. Is it, that's kind of how I'm understanding it is, okay, so let's say Ted Wilson, for example. Ted Wilson, if he was to turn his stuff around, then he could potentially, well, at this point, he could still come in as a priest, but I mean, it's probably not going to happen, but he could come in as a Levite. I'm just using him as an example, just because we all know who he is. Um, he couldn't be a Nethanim because he's, because he's already a Jew, right? So he can't be a Nethanim because the, the Nethanims were non-Jews. So... Anyways, I'm getting off the topic here. Um, so as, as a collective, as the organization and the leadership, this is what I see the fifth line is talking about two things. It's talking about the United States as an institution. And an institution, I think a part of an institution is the people that are a part of that institution. So the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you have leadership here that is being, that has started to be passed, passed by at 1989. And then when 9-11, if I understand correctly, when 9-11 came and they rejected that, that was the completion of the passing of leadership. Is that, is that not right? But it's still, but they're still, 
they're not acknowledging this movement at the Sunday Law. She does actually say, I wish I could tell you what video, all of you guys listening, but she does actually say that it's still a Seventh-day Adventist church. It's still the United States. It's under a new yeah. leadership. Yeah, no, I that's... I remember what because... she says it in. Well, would it be that um, you have to make a choice between Barabbas and Christ yep. and that the church institution ha is still having to recognize that they're following a different leader? And I don't mean by a person, but that the church is going so far off base that it's not the Christ. It's not true, the true Christ. It's the Antichrist. Right. And the United States would have to recognize, the people in the United States would have to recognize that even though we still give lip service to the fact that we have a constitution, that we are not following the constitution. So therefore, we have switched leaders because uh, those would be like the representatives of the leadership of the United States because the president takes a sworn oath to uphold the Constitution. So whoever is in that office that's making that diversion, and you know, that's been a movement too because Trump couldn't have just made this diversion on his own. It's been put into place by previous presidents, each knocking a pin out, so to speak. So could that be what we're looking at? It, it, it. It is, I mean, it, it is a change in leadership. It's, it's, the United States is going to take on a new form of government, like Sister Adriana said, with communism, it's going to take on a new form of government because its government has been based on the United States Constitution. They're going to unite church and state, which is going to base, become a new um, institution, uh, so to speak. In the Seventh-day Adventist Church, it'll still be Seventh-day Adventist Church, but it'll be under a new leadership. I wish I could remember what video to point you guys to, but I know that um, she said that in a few different places. Okay, Adriana posted, and it's a good. Oh, sorry, you cut out. Um, Adriana posted, and it's a good point because she po she posted um, that marriage is an institution too. And when I, I this is going to help me kind of make my po my point or my question that I'm trying to ask, because marriage is an institution, but without the two people, you don't have the institution. Same with Sabbath. If you don't have the people in God, you don't have the Sabbath. There's because the, the Sabbath was made for man, and it was for us to come to God. So it's an institution, and without the, without the people that are a part of the institution, then there's no such thing as an, as an institution. So it, and it's kind of where I'm getting confused is because we have the line of the 144,000. We have the priests, the Levites, the Nathanums. But then with the fifth line, and it's talking about the institutions, like, What's the line of the 144,000 then? Like, I don't understand. Because it seems to me that that's, I mean, I, don't even, I still don't even know who the 144,000 are. Um, before you continue really quick, um, I Googled it because Google. Um, and some of the definitions that came up for it, I think, are interesting. The first is a society or organi organization founded for a religious, educational, social, or similar purpose. And then the second is an established law, practice, or custom mm -hmm. for institution. So it's not, it's not just the body of the people. It's also a system of belief. I think it's yeah. both. It's both yeah, that's combined. What I mean. Yeah, yeah. What I'm saying. I'm that's saying it's both. It I'm saying that the definition links to both. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that it's both. It's because when you look at marriage, it has to be both that what I forget what the wording was in the in the definition, but with without the people or without that plan of marriage of the two combining together and becoming one, it has to be a combination of those two things. So, it, so it's it, it, there's no institution if there's no people, and there's no institution if there's no covenant or whatever you want to call it, because they're making a covenant with one another. So an institution is like the combination of the people that are a part of it, but also the covenant or agreement that they're, that they're coming under. The people Donna, and, and it's like, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I actually, I just wanted to, to possibly clarify something. Um, at Sunday law on the institution fifth line, the United States continues, but what it changes Am I right in saying 
it, it becomes the seventh kingdom, which is the United Nations, but it's the USA in its new chain leadership at, at the head of that. It, it's still the United States that's going to be in charge of the United Nations, it's the most powerful country. There's now no Russia after Pan Am. So the United States, as Sister Elaine said earlier, it, it, it's changed and it's changed leadership. Does it? Um, and so what I was thinking is in, in terms of, Jonathan, earlier you said about the, all the people are contained in the lines, the 144,000 the priests and ethanims. Mm -hmm. But there are people that are lost in the world and they're going to be, they're not going to be a part of the nephonyms that come in. So there are going to be people that are still holding on to these institutions. For example, Seventh-day Adventism, the institution changes you know, dies, if you like, at the Sunday Law. But we know there are going to be Seventh-day Adventists that haven't I, I think they're still accepted any of the truth. And so they're going to still... I think they still go to church. Like, I think I've heard that yeah. in one of, one of the presentations before, that they, they keep going like nothing happened. Like, they don't recognize when the Sunday Law kind of came or something like they they the institution even though it's dead because i don't know if we can do this like at 9 11 can we mark a deadly wound right here in regards to the institution and then it dies here the same way that we do with the king of the north and the king of the south i think it's at midnight where where what where it dies um no 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 it's panium panium is where the is it no because the u.s the u.s is in full force so the u.s constitution the good part of it gets its deadly wound at panium and it goes downhill as the u.s that's the bad part rises and gets to power the overturning right because you're overturning but you're still getting to be powerful because at sunday law the u.s is going to be more powerful than it ever was but it's, that's what I'm saying. The Constitution isn't going to be regarded anymore. And that's also part that's of all. the institution. It will have a new Constitution, whatever they do, or I don't know if it's going to be that way. But you know what he's doing? When you watch how she's laying out her presentations and going through these histories, the back to the Tower of Babel, they're fighting always to have their, their one world order. And that's what's coming it's the tower of the war we've always been learning through conspiracy theories looking to the european union and looking at that uh where i where is it it starts with an s where they have the the tower that they built um but it's actually the united states that's building that tower of babel to be um ruler of the world and changing the government as we know it but it's going to be a government over the whole world as opposed to the United States as we as you know it's no longer going to be the protector of man as it has been with the Constitution and won't it be the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is that that's two tables also right uh, the, have you seen it say that again I was looking at Adriana's question let me answer her question hold that uh, I'm sorry, because I can't see what you see. No, that's okay. So the dictatorship is being marked at starting at 2016. Okay, go ahead, Susan. So, oh, so then, I was, go ahead, sorry. I'll ask after. Well, two things. What Jonathan had said about the church remaining with the structure, they'll be turned Catholic because that would be hanging sticking with traditions and customs of men and not recognizing that the church is no longer the <laughs> saving organization, right? So, so and the, the other thing was, Babylon? does the church become, if pardon? they become Catholic, then don't they become Babylon at this point? That's what I would, they would have to by then, right? Because they would no longer be the church anymore. 
right? That's, a big That's what I would think too. That's a big statement. On the other, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was I was just saying that's a big statement because there's probably implications to saying that. <laughs> well, we're not saying it yet, but after the fact, yeah. it would. I think so. I would think the test did say that. She did say that. Okay. She did say that 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 the, the ones who don't come or or, or uh, don't pass the Sunday law, it's Babylon. Because it unites, it unites with Babylon. Because yeah. there's either you unite with God's true people or you unite with Babylon. There's only two choices. Yeah, yeah. There was, at some point, it would have to become Babylon if they stay with the false line, right? I, I am pretty. And sure. the other thing was the Declaration of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was what France did during the French Revolution. If you look at old pictures, it'll be two charts with that uh, Phrygian cap in the middle of them. But it's ten. It's a declaration of ten rights on two tables, just like the two tables of stone of God's Ten Commandments. And I believe that's what the UN uses, the declar universal, they call it, the universal declaration of human rights. Wouldn't that be what we would be transitioning to with the UN as opposed to our constitution and all that when we do make the transition in the United States. That's it. That's all I had to say. Um, Debbie says the Jews continued their system of offering and attended the synagogue after the crucifixion. They put their trust in their system, but it was left unto them desolate. That's a good point. They murdered the son of God. Their system, which he had instituted was meaningless but they had still believed in it and that they were the people of God, but they were wrong. And that's a good point. I think that's, we don't need to guess. I think we just need to look, to look back and see how it happened before. But I'm going to try to move on here because I've <laughs> got a lot left. Um, good conversation though. Um, okay. So this is a separate line to the ones of before that we've been drawing up because the 144,000 is a group of people at the end of the world. The priests are a group of people at the end of the world, as are the Levites and the Nethanims. So these four are all about the experiences of different groups of people that are being called and chosen. <clears throat> this reform line is about two institutions that are both raised up as some form of protection for these hey, groups of people. John, did you change the slide? No. Oh, okay. I thought you did. Okay. I was just, I thought I froze. Sorry. No, no. Because we're still talking about this line. Okay. Um, so this reform line is about two institutions that are both raised up as some form of protection for these groups of people. And these institutions in their job function, uh, job function as what they're meant to do. They bring us right to where they're meant to. And they fulfill their job function, which is to get us to the Sunday law. But there's serious problems within them, and we can particularly hi highlight that in the history of the American Civil War, which is back here. Whoops. Where did my slide go? Okay, so Civil War, welcome back here. I think that's all I needed. And for those institutions that we're, that there's a reform line and a closer probation, and it's for those institutions that there's a reform line and closer probation and judgment. Okay, so over here. So that's just the review that I want to pick up th uh, that point. When it comes to a camp meeting, it really becomes impossible to share the information in a proper kind of systematic fashion and, it, and to cover it adequately. So it becomes a hard decision to know what to cover and what not to cover. What I'm hoping to do at, a, at camp meetings is not so much give the material and repeat what was done in Arkansas. I'm hoping that people have, have followed past Arkansas Arkansas was the groundwork for a much greater message, and it's impossible for that message to continue to be repeated in every detail. Uh, someone's typing there. I can kind of hear it. Sorry. Um, Arkansas was the groundwork for a much bigger message, and it's impossible for that message to continue to be repeated in every detail. Much of that has to stop being taught, and it has to be accepted that people have been watching Guadeloupe and Portugal and Romania and Brazil, and that they're already familiar with how this message has grown. If they haven't, they cannot wait for a camp meeting to catch up. It's not going to happen. If people are waiting waiting for Germany, the international camp meeting in Germany, I think is what she's talking about, to hear about World War II, 
we're not covering any of this in Germany. That's new material, so there is a very strong need to keep up. This movement that you want to be baptized into is a movement. It's moving. It can move at the pace of the slowest, but, it's, but if the slowest is willfully not following, they are left behind. They become, that becomes an act of choice. And if you follow the teachers and the leaders that I'm seeing in this movement, many of them are becoming tired. They cannot do the work of educating every person when there's, when there's everything that's already done with camp meetings and schools and YouTube. Everything's already out there. That's an individual work for people that people have to choose to do. So there's a great deal of material that cannot be retaught, uh, that cannot be retaught here. It's already out in the public record. And that becomes personal choice whether or not people want to access that. So I'm going to skip large parts of information and I'll try to tell you when I'm doing that so that you, so that you can, if you want to fill in those gaps, go back to one of those previous presentations. So I want us to consider the reform line of Christ. You can do all kinds of applications with this reform line. So I want you to consider the following. If we were to see the reform line of Christ, um, if we were to see the reform line of Christ, it begins at his birth, and then we have his baptism. And you can go to the story of Acts 27, and you can see its, full stru its overall structure of that second ship based on how we're placing three groups of people the message comes in three distinct phases. So when you come to the reform line of Christ, first of all, you have Christ and the disciples. Um, you have Christ and the disciples. And there's one group called out and they're trained and they're given specific training. You have birth and baptism and then you come to the triumphal entry and then the cross. Um, okay. I want to suggest that all the first that that that's I want to suggest that's all the first group of people. This is all the training of one core group who are meant to do a work. Once the disciples are trained, they go through the refining process, and then what? Then you have Pentecost. And what what are they going to do? Who are they taking the message to? The Gentiles? The Jews. No, no it goes back to the church. So they're trained to reach the church. So the first group, the first group, and then the second group till 34 AD. And then what happens? Then they go to a third group, and this is the Gentiles. So primary application, where is the cross on our reform line? For you and me, where is the cross, and who are we going to? It's the Sunday law. Gentiles, she says, as a question, I think. We're not going to the Gentiles here. We're going back to the church. So I think she's... I'm kind of she's getting talk, I think she's talking about Pentecost. Yeah, so from the cross to Pentecost, right? Or the cross to 34 AD. Pen yeah. So we're not going to the Gentiles here. We're so going back to the church. If if our cross was the Sunday law, which was 2014 to Pentecost, which is um, Raphia, that's been this dispensation that we've been living in. And then the next dispensation to 34 AD, I don't know, because we're not technically going until Panium. So I don't know if it's from cross to Panium, is cross to, from Sunday law to Panium is cross to Pentecost. Anyway, she, she's pointing out yeah. that we're, she's more focused on who we're going to and when. Yeah. So we're going to the church um, after Sunday law, after our Sunday law. So she's referring to the priests here. Um, they, don't, they don't go to the church here. They need, um, actually, she, she said, yeah, they don't go to the church here. They, <clears throat> they need some time in the upper room, and they got some problems they need to sort out, a bit more training. So what's the cross? If this is the time of the end at birth... Oh, yeah. um, and this is 9-11 at baptism and this is the loud cry or the midnight cry in 2018 at the triumphal entry and the cross is the probation uh, for who though because we have many closes of probation if it's the close of probation for the Jews then why are they going back to them here prior to 34 AD 
So this is raffia. The cross is raffia. And this is also November 9th, 2019. Then you can start seeing this work for the church. What I want us to see is if we take the whole history of the church and the disciples at the end of ancient Israel, the cross is raffia. It is specifically the close of probation, not for the Jewish nation or for the world, but for this group of people. So when we think about the experience of the cross, that's what we're coming to. In its primary application, it's speaking about 2019 at the end of the world. And I want us to keep that in our minds because we're going to come back to that. We have to make sure we know where we are in that story. We have to make, we have to take that seriously, the, take seriously the history that we're currently walking through. So I don't want to repeat the history of Pyrus. We've been repeatedly doing that for the last eight months. I just want to highlight a couple of points uh, that we get from that. We go from Act 27 to the history of Pyrus and... Um, I'm confused here. Okay. And what do we notice about the history of Pyrus? How many parts does it come in? Come in? It comes in two parts. First, he conquers a Macedonia, and this is where he tries to establish his empire. How well does that go for him? Badly. And then he tries to establish an empire in Italy. So the first thing we notice when we go to the history of Pyrus is, it, is that it's in two, two parts. First, the Macedonia, and then secondly, in Italy. So the first, no, sorry, I just said that. When we notice, when we notice, what we notice is he has an alpha history and an omega history. We took the history of Pyrus, we go into the history of the kings of Pyrus, and what do we notice? How many of them until Pyrus? From the first to Pyrus, what, what number is Pyrus? He's the 10th. So not to repeat it, but to remind us, we're trying to understand Pyrus. We can demonstrate Pyrus is the king of the south. Um, and we see that his, uh, the king of the south, we, we can demonstrate Pyrus is the king of the south. We go to the leaders of Pyrus and we see that of his nation, the first is Admetus and Pyrus is the 10th. Then we see that there's a period of time where he co-rules. Then he returns and he, re and he represents the king of the south in our day. We took this history. We took this history. We bring it to another. We see the king of the south in our day is Vladimir Putin. <clears throat> who's also the 10th. Uh, Putin serves, sorry, we took this history. And if you go back 10 from Vladimir Putin, we come to Stalin. And Putin serves two consecutive terms under the constitution. He cannot run for a third. So what did he do? He, he ruled. And that, that was not hidden. It was wide open that there were two leaders of Russia, Medvedev and Putin. They even made it their campaign slogan, Together We Stand. They co-ruled. Medvedev dutifully stood down and Putin came back, facing the largest protest that Russia had ever seen since the fall of the Soviet Union, when he had said that he was coming back as president. They knew they had a dictator set up. So he returns over here. Um, so we already start to see a repeating pattern. And then we traced Aesides, Pyrus's, or Adam, Admetus's father, I believe, that's what she's referring to here. Um, and then we trace Aesides, his father who falls in a coup. Uh, rival takes the throne before Aesides comes back and Aesides is killed. He's too much weakened by the, um, the insurrection and, and by the insurrection caused by his rival. He's weakened and removed, but, and his brother takes the throne. What's the problem with his brother, Alcides? Alcides has no self-control. He loses the respect of his people. They deposed him and they had, and then they placed Pyrrhus as a young boy, very inexperienced. So we take this down to this history and we start filling in the gap. We identify Gorbachev and Gorbachev was removed by a coup. And then a rival took the next presidency Gorbachev took it back and he lost so much power in the coup that the Western leaders no longer had any respect for him and his own people were tired, tired of him. So he resigns. And when he steps down, it's the end of the Soviet union and Boris Yeltsin took power. And what's the problem with Boris Yeltsin? 
No self control. No self. No self control and what? Alcoholic. He's an alcoholic. So what did that impact his health? Oh. Okay. By the time he he stepped down, he was also stepping down because of his health, and he was a very sick man. And you have Putin take the presidency, comparatively inexperienced, just like Pyrus was. Uh, inexperienced, like anyone who'd come before. Unlike anyone who had come before, he'd only been involved in state politics for about three years, local politics a little bit longer. If we were to go backwards from Stalin, you would see Tsar Nicholas, and when Tsar Nicholas is deposed, what ends? Anyone know what ends here? The, um, the, the ki their type of kingdom, whatever it was, their, their... But it's not that. The monarchy. Yeah, it is monarchy. Yeah, you're right. I thought I had a so then, then in comes Lenin, and what's Lenin's problem? Health. Lenin has a health issue. So his health forces him to retire from an active role in government. Lenin places Stalin, and he lives, and Lenin lives to regret it. Um, I think is what you see the same here with Yeltsin, uh, Yeltsin, and Alcides. So. He lives to regret it. Boris Yeltsin resigns because of his health. He placed Vladimir Putin in power. He lived to regret it. Both of them placed dictators. Lenin placed Stalin. Boris Yeltsin places Vladimir Putin. Both retired from government because of their health failing. When Tsar Nicholas steps down, he ended the monarchy. When Gorbachev steps down, he ended the Soviet Union. When Tsar Nicholas, uh, sorry, I just said that. You can do really neat parallels to see the similarities between Stalin and Putin. Um, so this is where you start to see secular authors come in, come in that are plowing the nethinims. They are able to identify Trump as Hitler, but they're also saying that Vladimir Putin is a repeat of Stalin. And they do that by going right back to his upbringing, how he was brought up, his training, how he thinks, how he rules. Even those that love Stalin and love Vlad Vladimir Putin, they show the similarities between them. So because this structure that we've done just that for the basic outline. Okay, so one point, and that's going to the next slide. So one point I wanted to point out here is that another thing that I found that is interesting is that God is giving two witnesses to what Putin will be. So he, sh um, and I think that's why we had, why, how Tess went back and found Stalin, because to show one parallel, eh, coincidence, but when you're showing a second parallel to the whole thing and it's within the same line then it becomes a convincing matter and that's why we need more than two witnesses two or more witnesses yeah you have daniel 11 40 is also another witness because you have russia could not have died they have to resurrect if they have a deadly wound and they die they also have to resurrect right. so it, it, it becomes a compound thing where it's it's laying out a different aspect of this but then it also has a witness for that as well yeah so, all right, so using, why is that up there? I have no idea. Okay, so Zara Nicholas is Gorbachev, Lenin is Yeltsin, and Stalin is Putin. So that's a complete parallel. And Macedonia and Italy, World War II, and Putin. Okay, so using this structure that we've done, just the basic outline, we're able to see the Pyrus came in an came in an alpha and an omega history. And if Pyrus is Putin and Putin is Stalin, then Pyrus is also going to tell us about the uh, is also going to tell us both alpha and omega histories. If A equals B and B equals C, then A also equals C. If that makes sense to you. All right. So Pyrus comes in Alpha and Omega, therefore the King of the South in our time comes in Alpha and Omega, and we can say that with this model, say that with this model. So if we're going to see an Alpha history of the King of the South in our time, it's going to be the history of Stalin and World War II in our history under Vladimir Putin. So Pyrus's history in Macedonia illustrates the history of World War II. And when you line up Pyrus's experience, oops, uh, in Macedonia, you clearly see the repeat of the events in World War II, right from the invasion of Poland, the Molotov, I'm, in, I'm on the wrong slide here, I think, 
kind of no idea what happened. So I'm going to get out of this one. I think I'm on the next one. I, need, I think I need to spend more time on the less time on the presentations, more time on the notes. <laughs> 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 Figured out my problems. <laughs> okay, this so is cool. why you present because then you learn. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is where I want to be. I like the part. So I think we've probably seen this chart before, but it's a good one. Um, so we've done the basic outline. We're able to see Pyrus come in an alpha and omega history right here with Macedonia and Italy. Um, yeah, I don't have my, my slide break, so I don't know where my notes change. I think you're fine. Just keep reading. No, I'm just trying to find my notes for it so it goes along with what um, with this slide. So we're going to see an alpha history. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so Pyrus comes in the alpha and omega history. Therefore, the king of the south in our time comes in an alpha and omega history in World War II and World War III. Um, so if we're going to see an alpha history of the king of the south in our time, it's going to be the history of Stalin and World War II in our history under Vladimir Putin in World War III. So Pyrus's history, Macedonia illustrates the history of World War II. And when you line up Pyrus, Pyrus's experience in Macedonia, you can clearly see the repeat of the events in World War II, right from the invasion of Poland, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, Operation Barbarossa. Everything here is repeated here. So we know that everything in the history of Italy is repeated in the line of Vladimir Putin in the World War III line here. So we have these Alpha Omega histories, the Alpha of the King of the South and the Omega of the King of the South. And this is what we would, we would have spent a lot more time laying out if we had more time, but it has been done. So when we take an Alpha and Omega history, this is nothing new. We do this all the time. We take the history of Moses and Alpha history of ancient Israel. I'm supposed to be on the last slide. <laughs> now I realize I was in the right place in the first place. And the history of Christ and the Omega history of ancient Israel ancient Israel, then we take the history of the Millerites and Alpha history of the modern of modern Israel and the history of the 144,000, the Omega history of modern Israel, and what do we do with them? We overlay them. So we're going to not only learn about our time from the history of Christ, we're also going to see and learn from learn of our history from the line of Moses and the line of the Millerites. So all of these three histories teach us the reform line of the 144,000. That was this the other thing that I wanted to show. So this, this slide here is showing the same thing. You're getting two or three witnesses pointing to what is about to happen in the line of Putin. And you're getting two or three, uh, three witnesses also pointing to what's going to happen with 144,000. So God has clearly laid it out. And we're, okay. So he, now we he, he puts in a lot to help us see that we can have faith in these lines because this is what's guiding our movement. So it's exactly. a lot of facts. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's established now because you have two or three witnesses and that's all you need for something to be established. So, yeah. All right. So now we can get into this one. So if we're going to draw up a chart, what we're going to do is we're going to overlay these four histories so that, so this first box here, this is Pyrus's alpha history in Macedonia, and it's an alpha. Then we have Pyrus in Italy, and it's an omega. Then we have, we have World War II, and it's an alpha. And finally, we have World War III, and that's our history, and it's an omega. Okay, caught up. Pyrus in Macedonia starts with the Battle of Ipsus. What's particularly unusual about the Battle of Ipsus? What is its special characteristics? Yes, I'm thinking about who's fighting who and who is friends. There's an alliance. Um, World War II starts with an alliance. Uh, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. I lost myself again. Okay. And the invasion of Poland. So we take that down and we overlay it to 2014. Here also with Pyrus in Italy, you can also see a treaty. It isn't really this first story that I'm wanting to discuss. What I'm wanting to wanting us to see is these three battles there. Isn't it, there isn't a union between the King of the North and the King of the South. I want us to see 
sorry, that's not what she said. What I'm wanting us to see is these three battles where there isn't a union between the King of the North and the King of the South. I want us to see them when they're fighting. When we go to Pyrrhus and Macedonia, it starts with the conflict between the King of the North and the King of the South. It starts with an invasion, and this is the invasion in Thessaly. And then there is an invasion of Epirus, and then there is an invasion of Macedonia. In the, vision of, in the invasion of Thessaly, whose are two players in this history? Who is the King of the North? Does anyone know who the King of the North is in Thessaly? Um, it's the... Yeah, it's Dem yep. Demetrius, yeah. Yeah, Demetrius. So if Demetrius is the king of the north, then who's the king of the south? Pyrrhus. Pyrrhus is king of the south. So in this history, we have Demetrius versus Pyrrhus. And who instigates that conflict? Pyrrhus. So Pyrrhus. The king of the south comes against the king of the north. And who wins? The north. The north. So then there's an invasion of Pyrrhus. And who instigates that battle? The north. Yeah. And the north wins. And then the invasion of Macedonia, who instigates that battle? The South. The South and the South wins that battle. Okay. So is everyone that, clear with it? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. So there was an alliance there, but that's fine. But that's not what her... Yeah, the I alliance is back here. I guess she's shown this line here is the alliances, but these are yeah. all the battles. Macedonia, there was an alliance too, but it's fine. It's not the point of what she's doing. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, and then there's... So the South attacked the North and the North wins. The North attacked the South and the South win and the North wins. The South attacked the North and the South won. Now we come down to Pyrrhus in Italy. And we have three battles between Rome and Pyrrhus. First is the Battle of Heraclea. Then there's the Battle of Asculum. And finally, we have the Battle of Beneventum. At the Battle of Heraclea, who, com who comes against who? The north comes against the south, and the south wins. There you go. And Asculum? I think south against north, and south wins. Or still north against south? Yeah, yeah. And then south wins. And then... Yeah. North against south, and north wins. Yeah. Yeah, the north wins. So then in the line of World War II, we mark three conflicts between Stalin and the Soviet Union and Hitler's Nazi Germany. The first one was in August of 1940, and this was more of a diplomatic trade disagreement. It gives us many of the characteristics that we bring to our day. We're going to go into this one in a fair amount of detail. First of all, August 1940, then Operation Barbarossa, uh, the beginning of the Eastern Front when Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, and then 1945 when the Soviet Union pushed back at the end. So then... August of 1940, who, in, who initiated the breakdown of the alliance between Soviet Union and Hitler? Um, the Russia did. Yeah, so Russia being the king of the south and... Um, north winds. North winds. So it was the king of the south... The Soviet Union, who came out for the better, Barbarossa, who invaded who? Hitler invaded the Soviet Union. So Hitler invaded the Soviet Union after that. And who came up better in the Eastern Front? North. So the North comes up better in the Eastern Front in 19, and in 1945, they pushed their way into Germany. Uh, they met with the Western force on the Elbe River. They defeated Hitler, and it was a victory for the South on the last one. And in our history, we already have names for these two battles. We call them Raffia and Panium. And what do we say comes against, who, sit, who comes against who at Raffia? South against North. So where do we get that from? I don't know, because I thought that we've been seeing Trump instigate against Russia this whole year. So I'm confused about that. No. But um, Raffia we get from Daniel 11. Yes. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So Daniel 11 is where we get both um, both of these, I think, right? Yep. Okay. So, and we know that in this one here, the North comes against the South, and of course the North is finally victorious. So because uh, the North comes against the South and the North wins this battle, 2018 already happened, and they were going to... And we are going to demonstrate 
that it's the north that came against the south and the south one. Oh, so there is still a raffia. So 2018 was something. <laughs> yeah, so ra raffia was the first one, and I guess we missed that one. But I you still mean don't. 2018 know what, was the first one. Is it? Was it? It had to do with the election, or was that? No, that was. There's a couple of pres. There's several presentations she did on 2018. If you look up on their Australian Prophecy School, you if you watch the one called Heraclea, it explains all of this. Uh, Heraclea is all the things that Trump did back against all the internet. Um, oh, I know what it was. It was when he shut down. That was midterm elections. So what he did was he shut down the, um, he shut down the internet research agency yeah. with. Um, yeah. I forget what it was. Anyways, he had his hackers shut them down so that they wouldn't inf interfere with the midterm elections. And Putin was. He wasn't happy with it because it showed like a sign of distrust. It was like a break of the alliance that they had. Right. Made. So that was the first battle. Cool. All right. Hold that, okay. hold that screen there for a second. Is that one all done? Uh, just about. Okay. Before you let me know when it's the last one, because I want to take a screenshot of it, if you don't mind. Okay. Well, I'll, I can send it out after if you want it um, in uh, PowerPoint or whatever, if you want, or if you just want a screenshot. Okay. Um, so yeah, and the King of the South, wait a minute, now I'm confused. So how did the King of the South? Because Trump lifted sanctions and gave him that Bill Browder and he left Syria. He gave him Bill Browder? I thought Bill, Bill I, Browder. I thought he was going to give him Bill Browder. He asked for it, but he didn't say he gave it to him. He didn't give him to him because Bill Browder is still free. Yeah, he's hiding. He is free, no, no. But he, Oh, okay. But I know he, I'm pretty sure he lifted sanctions, didn't he? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. So they had Nitskaya, whatever her name was, in uh, Trump yeah, Tower Callie for the babies. Nitskaya. Yeah. You all yeah. know he is calling troops out? Of, yeah, of Syria, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Is, everyone, is everyone getting this, everyone who's here? Because I know I'm not really presenting it the greatest, but. No. This was good. What is everyone understanding these three battles? It's yes. One piece of oh. time that sticks in our brain, but some of this is sticking in my brain even better. So yeah, it, it, Heraclea, it, it, was, Heraclea was a whole bunch of things that Trump did, um, but Putin still wound up winning because Trump pulled troops out of, I know there were other things, but Trump pulled troops out of uh, Afghanistan so, and Syria. Or, yeah. Yeah, Trump, Trump broke the alliance that they had back here, but the right. king of the south ended up winning this battle. And, and they're just battles. And the battles that we see now are obviously, they're not physical battles. Ipsis, Ipsis is 2016. It's not what she had. The alliance had to be in 2014 because the election. Collusion. The alliance is 2014, but it's kind of, I don't know if, I don't know if sometimes it just lays out different for, for a different, yeah. it could be, but Ipsis is 2016. You're right. <laughs> so, um, so, I mean, unless she's laying it out this way for a different point that she's trying to make. But it must be, and that's where I really get confused. I, don't I know, I know. It is it gets confusing because, and I don't know if it's her just having said it wrong in the particular presentation, which I know these guys are tired, and uh, we all do it. Maybe, um, let me go back on the video, because this could have been 2016 here, because that was the election. Yeah, yeah. And 2014 was... I know that they had collusion. Collusion in 2014. It began, but really the election was the was the proof of the alliance, wasn't it? Because the because that's when the Russian hackers were. Well, no, it was leading up. It was a progressive thing, I guess. And it was it was the only battle that they fought together on the same side when they took down Antigonus. Dimitri. That's because they had a mutual a mutual. It's outcome. twenty. It's 2014 in the video. Is it okay? Yeah. So it's one of those confusing things that happens. I don't, I think she's, I think what she's trying to mark is the alliance, not the exact date, but an alliance. Because the next thing you have in the next column, going all the way down from Thessaly to Heraclea, August 1940, 2018, is a breakdown of that alliance in their first battle. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Maybe that's because yeah. I know she she does things for a reason. Sometimes she is careful and she does things for a reason. So I don't know. So is there anyone who's 
here tonight that doesn't at least understand why these dates are the la the the bottom four. If there's anyone who doesn't understand, I mean, ask the questions because this is this is really important. Yeah, it is. And the rest of these are backing it up, but our line our line is obviously important. This is all to back up with what we're trying to say about our history, but understanding. You need to understand all of it, but if you don't, at the very least, don't understand this, then it's a good time to ask about it. And the alpha lines are, I'm kind of starting to finally get it, but the alpha lines are a line of failure where the king of the south wins. The omega lines are the, there you go, you were already there, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a failure, a success, a failure, and a success. We see the pattern. And obviously, if there was no, if the alpha line was a success, there'd be no need for an omega. So, now where am I in my notes? I think it's interesting that you have um, Moses as an alpha and Christ as a success, because yeah. that was the history leading up to his first coming. And then leading up to his second coming, you have Millerites as an alpha and us as a success. So it's like two huge, like 3,000 year dispensations, kind of, which mm -hmm. is cool because then you have the week and then you have the seventh day anyways, but you have the first one where Jesus first came and then the second one. The success always has to be where he comes, otherwise he can't come. That's right. Yeah. yeah that's right. Um. Can you briefly or can someone briefly explain why Moses' this line was a line of failure? Was it because of the murmuring and everything that happened before they went into Canaan? Is that what we point out? Um, I think so, because then they have to go wandering in the wilderness. That's on a smaller scale, on a zoomed-in scale, though. But overall, once they did get into Canaan... That's why I was thinking that at Saul, it all went downhill because they just said, no, we don't want you to lead us anymore. We want a human being. So they put their faith in man. They said, we want to follow a human being instead of God. So they wanted and, to be like the world. Yeah. Basically. It was like, a, just not even a hidden, ridiculous thing that they asked. And God said through his prophet, Samuel, he said, He's going to kill your children. He's going to take them from you. He's going to take your land. He's going to take your money. He's going to take everything you have, and you'll have nothing you can say to him. And they're like, yeah, 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 we know. Let's have that king now. It's crazy. So I don't know. I, that's where I see a huge falling down that just they never came back from. So they – and plus they were, you know, at the at Mount Sinai, they – you know, Moses was receiving the law and they were already disobeying and worshiping and creating idols and stuff. Yeah. So it's a rejection of what they had. I mean, because when we look at the Millerite line, this is for people in this movement will understand because we, we understand the, our history, but to call it. Okay. For me to call the Millerite line, a line of failure and to look at us as the line of success, because we have such an understanding of what they went through it's it's hard to say that because these people you were saying the other night there was a quote and i i, I haven't been able to find it so because i think you paraphrased it but never before was there a group of people that was so prepared for to go to heaven as, uh, yeah i think i can find it for you if you can send me yeah send that to me or whatever um because that's a big statement in the history of the entire world that yeah. group of, there, was, there was never a group before and we're supposed to be better which is crazy mega the omega yeah. so and then it's the same thing when you look at the line of moses i mean i mean i just always think like there's all these histories of people and it's like we're i kind of feel like we're at the worst end of the whole history how are we going to be better but it's not us right it's uh, yeah i had that thought too because i'm like ellen white and the pioneers like we read their work they were some of the most intelligent people intelligent i've ever people. seen they were Pious. famous you know, like, yeah yeah, and I'm like, and us, like these, us, we're their counterparts? What are you talking about? But Adriana, uh, it's God, White, yeah. Adriana, Sister White says that, you know, the dregs of the dregs sort of thing, the off scouring. <laughs> I'm the, a dreg. At the, at the very end, you know, the, the, 
the least of all. And that's how God is most glorified. Amen. You're right. Because you look at who he, who he's used consistently throughout the history of the Bible. And he's not using, he's typically he's not using the people that consider themselves great. He, he shows us what he can do through the, the meekest and the, the greatest sinners. I mean, you look at the, the apostles, they weren't the religious leaders. They were rough edged guys. You know, at that time, they were not the people that were considered to be the priests of that time, but they basically, Jesus said, I'll raise even these people up as priests and they'll bypass the leadership. So it's what God can do through the people that are, I guess, I don't want to say we're the worst, but <laughs> we're the worst in the history of the world, but not maybe not the worst people in the world today. <laughs> I don't know. Your thought. So anyway. If Israel had have done the right thing under Moses, would they have had the reform line of Christ? Would they have had to go through the captivity and the hundred, hundred, hundreds of years? If the Millerites have been faithful in their history and not gone into Laodicea, would we have a history of the 144,000? No. It's specifically because of this and in, and in disappointment. And because there's fail, failure, Christ did not come back in their time. And you can demonstrate that from the writings of Ellen White. She is very clear that Christ should have, come, should have returned before 1888. And then he should have returned again in 1888 history, but he didn't because that history was not successful. There has to be a period of time, a period of captivity and an omega. So it's the exact same principle. While we learn from an alpha history, a history of failure, there are um, there are differences, and we can see that we that when we go to the external of the um, of the battles, we can take 1945 and learn a great deal about Panium, and we can take all this 1940, and it teaches us all about what happened in 2018. What we can't do is just drop everything straight down and take and take all of that box into 2018 without noticing a pattern, and and that there is differences. And it fits the same thing when we take Millerite history and apply it to the line of the 144,000. There's two ways to get to a study of the King of the South. We can do it through Acts 27 and go to 273 BC and start tracing these histories of Pyrrhus. And without going into details of all the history, we've laid out the overall structure. What I want us to do is actually see it from the perspective of the counterfeit. I want us to go to the second subject of Daniel 11 verse 40 and the counterfeit. So if we turn to Daniel 11, verse 40, and we'll read it. it, says, And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So how many histories is this talking about? It's talking about two. So when we have two things, what can we do with them? We can compare and contrast so it can take uh, the first bit of Daniel 11 compared to the second part of Daniel 11. So the first, uh, the first part is what his is what history. I'm in the wrong slide again. I talked over that one. <clears throat> okay, this slide. All right. So in the first part of Daniel 11, verse 40, the time it, it's talking about the time of the end in 1798. 1798 is the end of what time period? There's, there's been 1260 years of papal persecution. All right. And there's been an ongoing war between the king of the north and the king of the south. This is the history of the French Revolution. Um, I don't know if she, when I did this, uh, if she was saying there was a war f from 538 to 1798 between France and the papacy. No. Uh, it just looked that way when she laid it out, but she, I don't think that's what she meant. So um, it had been leading up to, seven, to 1798, obviously, and that's where it kind of all came to a culmination. Yeah, the war comes before 1798. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's the history of the French Revolution. And if you want to mark a specific battle between France and the papacy, it would be in 1796. And that's when the papal troops are defeated by Napoleon. 
So there is an ongoing war and even a battle in this history between France and the papacy, and it culminates in 1798. Well, if I just read my notes, I'd know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I do that all the time. And I've read them several times because yeah, I, I, I do that all the time. <laughs> so I want us to see there is an ongoing war, and then in 1798, what happens? Internally, you, if you were to just continue, uh, consider the internal. It's the time of the end. There's an increase of knowledge. The book of Daniel is unsealed. And Napoleon captures the Pope. In Revelation 13, verse 10, it says, He that lead, lead, uh, leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity, and he that killeth by the sword must be killed by the sword. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. So who is this talking about? The papacy and the king of the north? Um, the papacy and the king of the north. What has the papacy been doing for 1260 years? He's been, he's been leading God's people into captivity because he led them into captivity. What was to happen to him? He has to go into captivity. And what was he doing to them for 1260 years? He was killing them with a sword. So what has to happen to him? He has to die by the sword. There's an important quote by, um, that becomes an important point. So we'll go to an important quote by Ellen White. General, uh, Great Controversy 439.2. Ah, man, I'm not keeping up with this. Okay, so 439.2. Power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months, and says the prophet, I saw one of the heads, as it were, wounded to death. And again, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity, and he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. The 40 and two months are the same as the time, times, and dividing of time three years and a half, or 1260 years of Daniel 7. The time during which the papal power was to oppress God's people. This period, as stated in preceding chapters, began with the supremacy of the papacy, A.D. 538, and terminated in 1798. At that time, the Pope was made captive by the French army, the papal power received its deadly wound, and the prediction was fulfilled, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. So what she is marking in 1798, the deadly wound, now we read Revelation 13.10, and how many parts in Revelation 13.10? There's two. If you lead into captivity, you must go into captivity. And the second part, if you killed, you must also be killed. Can you see that 1798, she says, fulfills which part? The first part. They led into captivity, so they had to go into captivity. Captivity. They liter literally went into captivity in 1798. So what about the second part? They are killed um, so they are killed and are they killed in 1798 no another Ellen White quote 8MR354.1 um, Ellen White is in France at the time and she says that afternoon November 2nd he who is Elder Bordeaux had us accompany him to the cathedral in Valence, France, and look upon the bust of Pius VI, who was noted in prophecy, who was, led, who was led into captivity and died in captivity. Here was the one marked in history who received the deadly wound. His heart is encased in the marble monument beneath where the bust is located. We felt rather solemn as we looked upon the monument of this man noted in prophecy. So when was Pius VI led into captivity? When did he die in captivity? 1799. So this is the deadly wound in 1798, and this is um, his death in 1798, 1799. Revelation 13.10, uh, blah, blah, blah. The kingdom, what is she talking about? In Bible prophecy, can you separate the, the kingdom from the king? Daniel 2, what happened in Daniel 2? Daniel shows to Nebuchadnezzar. Oh man, this is so confusing. Can I can? It's not confusing, but let me. Because she goes really fast, and you're going really fast. But if you put the video on half time, like I did, and she talks like this, it's really yeah. easy to understand what she's talking about. That's what I did the first time, and I, maybe I should have did that this time because I didn't. I can't believe how much better I learn when they talk slower or I force them to. Um, it's Take away your seven, second quote, your MR8. Eight. Yeah, it's uh, MR354.1. Thank you. 
I wow. couldn't find that in the Ellen White app though. So um, there's another place where I got that quote from. It was in my notes, but. Letter 110, 1886. Yeah, there's only two parts where I could find it. Um, and I don't think any of them were in AMR. So I don't know, but I have problems with my search. Anyways, you're, what we're doing is um, you're trying to see the difference between the deadly wound and the death, how they come in two separate parts and how they're both fulfilled. The deadly wound is the important part and then the death comes after. They don't both happen at the same time. That's no, I understand that. The part where I got confused is where I started reading and she's talking about Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 2. Right, because you can't separate a king from a kingdom. So if you say that this king dies, that means the kingdom dies oh, with yes. him. Okay, yeah, right. yeah. That's what it is. I knew that when I made it, but it's just when you're trying to read and put a presentation on, you're not really thinking about what you're saying. Yeah. Um, so Daniel shows to Nebuchadnezzar the statue and shows him the head of gold and says, this is Babylon, a Medo-Persia. And this is Babylon and Medo-Persia. But he says that head of gold is not just Babylon, it's Nebuchadnezzar himself. It shows us that in Bible prophecy, it gives us an important principle that you cannot separate a king from a kingdom. It's why we can take Pyrrhus and say that he is not just one man. He, he isn't just Putin. He is the king of the south in two histories. Pyrrhus doesn't just represent a man. He represents a kingdom. It's the same principle here. Pius VI doesn't just represent the papacy. It also represents the kingdom. It also represents the kingdom and the king. 1798, this part is fulfilled. He led into captivity, therefore he had to become a captive. But he had also killed the 12, for the 1260 years, um, not him himself, but uh, there also had to be a death in 1798, mark, uh, mark the beginning of the fall. They lost their pope with the temporal power in 1798 when he died in captivity. Then what do we know happens? There must be a resurrection in 1798. No, not in 1798. There must be a resurrection. 1798, she says, it fulfills part A. It fulfills the captivity. She doesn't say that 1798 fulfills part B. That part of the fulfillment is with the death of the Pope. So if this is the structure of Daniel 1140, part A, then what is the structure for part B? It has to follow the same pattern. So 1989 is the time of the end, and um, it's the end period of a period of time from 1863, and it's a 126. So here has been an ongoing war between the King of the North and the King of the South, and that war was the Cold War. And I think that's where I got confused was because, you no. Know, no, it's not where I got confused because this also makes sense because Russia and the United States obviously weren't fighting this whole time. The Cold War didn't start until the 1950s, I think. Um, so it's just a period in, in that time. Yeah. I think she drew with an arrow from one point to the other. And I was thinking, is, is she trying to say that, you know, they were going, going at it for that long, but that's not the case. I think the arrows were for the 126 and one. No, because you have, I don't know. Someone said that we had to open the, or the Sabbath. Oh, okay. Whoever said that, would they like to open the Sabbath for us? That would be me. <laughs> <laughs> Blessed Thank Father you. in heaven, Lord, is the Sabbath hour is now upon us. Uh, some of us are still, um, still in a different time, but I just want to stop and praise you and thank you for this study. Thank you for the work that you're doing through each one of us and helping us to put together the notes and put together presentations. And I pray that each one of us would receive such a blessing from doing so, Lord, that that this this work that you have us all doing together will knit us together as one. We just pray your blessing upon the Sabbath, that we would have a double portion of your spirit, Father, a double portion um, in our minds to help us to understand. We are thankful, Father, for the week that you've brought us through. And we are thankful and looking, looking to receive a refreshing on the Sabbath day. We pray, Father, that our minds would be stayed upon thee, that our hearts would be stayed upon thee, and that wherever there is um, discrepancies that are coming up in your message, that 
we would seek unity, Father. We would seek the mind of Christ, and we know we can't go wrong. So bless us this blessed Sabbath day, and I pray that each one of us would be a blessing to one another and a blessing to all those we come into contact with. We praise you, Lord, and we thank you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. All right, so we're in the second line, 1989, 126. So here's been an ongoing war between the North and the South. What war is that? The Cold War. So you have the King of the North versus the King of the South, and there has been an ongoing war. You come to 1989, and it's the time of the end, and there's an increase of knowledge. Uh, but what is 1989 for the King of the South? And who is the King of the South? The Soviet Union. Does the Soviet Union end with the fall of the Berlin Wall? No. What, what does that do to the Soviet Union? It cripples it. It's, it's a deadly wound. <clears throat> um, it's a deadly wound that it's never able to recover from, and it marks the beginning of its fall. It falls progressively until 1991 at its death. The King of the South does not end in 1989. This is the deadly wound, and we have, all, we have already discussed this, and we went to the line of Pyrrhus. We saw it with Acts 27. But where we mark Panium is just a deadly wound. It begins a fall as the U.S. comes up as the only world superpower. This history is repeated, this history is repeated in this history. Um... But when we see the way Mark marked and see way marks marked in prophecy, what is continually being highlighted is not the death but the wounding. When we see 1798 or 1989 or Panium, these are the battles being marked. Even in history, they end up being the most famous landmarks that people look back to. When the Soviet Union ended in 1991, the newspapers commented that this was so much less significant than the fall of the Berlin Wall. They said this was the one that we all remembered and were amazed by. By the time it died, now uh, no one was really surprised. We were just so used to the concept that it was ending. It is the wound way, Mark, that gets all the attention, both historically and in prophecy. You can, you can see that it only marks the beginning of the inevitable fall. So based on this principle, what do we know had to happen to the King of, King of the South after 1991? He had to resurrect. Uh, he couldn't be finished in that history. Um, he couldn't be finished in that history. I want us to consider the King of the South received a deadly wound and died. So we have compared and contrasted. We use the rules of the parab par of parable teaching to compare the King of the North and the King of the South. What about captivity? How do we treat captivity? And why does a power go into captivity? It is disobedient. So when we go to Daniel 2, what is the statue composed? Uh, what is the statue composed of in Daniel two? Uh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, way behind my notes here. And no wonder she repeats it. She repeats things so many times. Okay, so we have the Daniel. Never mind. Go on. Go on. Go on. <laughs> um. Okay, so when we go to the statue of Daniel 2, what's it composed of? It's composed of kingdoms, and we have Babylon, we have Medo-Persia, Greece, and we have Rome, and she doesn't really identify the feet. So, um, If you go to Daniel 11, what, what does it call all of those kingdoms? When you go to Daniel 11, what does it, uh, I've repeated that, it gives one name to all of them. If you go to Daniel 11, what is Rome and Greece in Daniel 11? They are the king of the north. Babylon was the king of the north, Medo-Persia took over and became king of the north, and then Alexander, and then Rome became the king of the north. So this statue is composed of the king of the north, and it is being compared and contrasted and lined up um, with another structure. What is this structure that it's counterfeiting? <clears throat> it is uh, counterfeiting the sanctuary animals. If this is counterfeiting the sanctuary animals, what is, what is it counterfeiting? Who is the true king of the north? Christ. So why does Satan want to be the king of the north? And she refers to Psalm 
uh, 48 verse 2, where it says, Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the great city of the, the city of the great king. The city of God is described as being on the side of the north. And in Isaiah 4, 14 verse 13, it says, is that the right verse? It says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend unto heaven, and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit, al I'll sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I think that's in Isaiah 40 something, isn't it? I have 14, 13 for some reason. No, it was in 14. It was? Okay. Yeah. Isaiah 14? 14 verse 13. And the first one was Psalm 48, verse 2. So when Satan uh, wanted to create this king of the north, and he is wanting to do what, he's, what he is wanting to do is counterfeit God because God is the true king of the north. So if the statue is the king of the north and the mountain is the king of the north, where is the king of the south? Who is the boss of the kingdoms of the statue? Satan is the boss of the kingdoms of the statue. So who is the boss of the mountain? God is the boss of the mountain. So where does the king of the south fit in this picture? And where does Islam fit into this picture? If we were to come into the history of World War II, what is Satan trying to do with the, with the king of the north? Hitler has gone into an alliance with the papacy. They're trying to take over the world. And who is the number one enemy? Russia. What did Hitler say to the ambassador of the United Kingdom? He said, the West are fools. You don't know, you don't all know. Wow, this is a bad transcription. You don't it's all It's not transcription. It's her, the way she talks. She said it exactly this that way. This is still my notes, so it could be mine. No, no, no. She says, they don't all da 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 Because it didn't make sense to me either, but I didn't want to just change her words up. But she says that, I promise you. Okay, so she says, you don't all know all I want is the USSR. You are just standing in my way. If you wouldn't fight me, I wouldn't fight you because all I want is him. That's well, how the people knew who to line up with. She Align actually says, all I want is da 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 da. And I didn't have the strength to put that in there. But What, pluralizing alls or all? Yeah. yeah. I used to talk like that when I was a kid. <laughs> um, probably still do. Okay, so then she goes to Matthew 12, 26. And if and it reads if and if satan cast out satan <clears throat> i tried to do this well the quotes but i didn't go back and do it so. um and if satan cast out satan he is divided against himself how how shall then his kingdom stand and in mark three twenty six, it reads and if satan rise up against himself and be divided he cannot stand but hath an end so what can satan not do he can't be divided against himself so what is happening in World War II? Where is communism in the statue? And where is Egypt in the statue? It's not there. There is no king of the south in the statue because the king of the south is not part of Satan's kingdom. The king of the south has no boss. Atheistic France in, French, in the French Revolution, who did they fight against? They fought against the papacy and against God. They make no distinction. They are in complete rebellion to both. So when you come to the history of World War II, who is Hitler's number one enemy? Russia, Stalin, the king of the south. And Satan has not created a kingdom that is divided against himself. Christ has told him what he already knows. He cannot afford to do that. He cannot set up two kingdoms that are completely opposed to one another and expect to establish himself. So when he came to his king of the north statue, they came under, so when we come to this king of the north statue, they come under one boss, and that is Satan. When we come to the mountain or God's kingdom, that is also represented by, by being the king of the north. They also have a boss, and this is God's kingdom. We do not find the king of the south in either statue. So what you end up with is independent ministries. Atheistic France and communistic Russia, they are in opposition not only to God, but also to Satan. This is the opposite side of the coin to the nature of man. If you can be morally good without God, you can be morally wicked without Satan. Who tempted Satan in heaven? No one. He had the power of his own will. Using his own will, he decided to lead the angels in rebellion. It's the exact same when you come to the king of the south using his own will. He does not need an outside influence to do the work that he does. Stalin did not need an outside influence. We can be good by exercising our own will, 
we can be wicked by exercising our own will. It's called freedom of choice. That was significant. Mm. So God's kingdom, what problem does God have with his kingdom? What can God's church do against him? We can disobey him. We can be rebellious. We can be difficult. We can call, and we can call that apostasy. When we go into apostasy, what happens? You go into captivity. This is what I want us to consider. We can compare and contrast the king of the north and the king of the south when we are talking about a deadly wound and a death. But when we are talking about captivity, it's punishment for apostasy. Okay. This was a cool point. I learned something from this. Say that last thing you said, captivity is what? Captivity is, is for apostasy, I think is what she said. Okay. Um, capti uh, captivity is punishment for apostasy. The king of the south cannot go into captivity. There is no story where this happens as a punishment for apostasy for the king of the south. So if we were to talk about God's kingdom, they go into apostasy. Um, and what does God do? He punishes them. He puts them in the captivity. And who does he bring? Who, uh, who does God bring against them? All the kings of the north. God is bringing the king of the north against his people. In Jeremiah verse twenty-five or chapter twenty-five verse eight, therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, because they have not heard my words. Verse nine: Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon, my servant and will bring them against the land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and an hissing and, a, and perpetual desolations. So does Babylon become part of God's kingdom? No. God called Babylon his servant, Nebuchadnezzar his servant. So he uses him. He uses something that is outside his own kingdom. God brings the king of the north against against his own people. The king of the north is not part of his kingdom. So if we were to consider Satan, the king of the north goes into captivity. Um, in 1798. And what has happened? Why does the papacy go into captivity? Uh, they go into captivity because of their disobedience and apostasy. You go into captivity as a punishment for apostasy. And when did the papacy go into the captivity for apostasy against their boss? In 1773, the kings of Europe give the papacy two choices. The kings of Europe sent their ambassadors to the Catholic Church, and they gave them two choices. Lose your temporal prosperity and give up, uh, give up to us some of your ter territory and your wealth or abolish the Jesuit order. For 1260 years, the papacy under their boss, Satan, have had a job description. Control the kings of Europe and persecute and kill God's people. Who is doing that for them? The Jesuits. The Jesuit order is founded to fulfill that job function. They control the kings of Europe and they orchestrate the persecution on God's people. In 1773, what condition has the papal church gone into? They have sunk into a Laodicean condition where they choose temporal prosperity, covetousness, and covetousness over their job function. They are given the exact same choice that we are given. You can line up the rest, um, the test for the Seventh-day Adventists and the test for the papacy. Do we want to fulfill the job function or do we want temporal prosperity? Um, they are given the choice in 1773 and what do they decide to do? They abolished the Jesuit order. What does Ellen White say about 1773? She says 25 years before, um, she says 25 years before 1798, persecution had almost wholly ceased. Why did persecution almost wholly cease 25 years before 1798? That takes you to 1773 and the abolishing of the Jesuit order. That is why the persecution ceased. It is when the Catholic Church stopped fulfilling their job function. When they stopped fulfilling their job function, who were they in rebellion to? Their boss. What is going to happen to them? 
who is he going to bring? Did God bring his own people against Israel? No. The statue, king of the north, are a separate entity, but he, but he uses them. Does Satan bring his own people against Babylon? No. He brings the king of the south. And I find that concept, oh, I didn't read, I did. I find that concept a bit interesting because if the king of the south is under no one's control, then how did Satan control them to come against the king of the north? That's just where my head goes when I think about that. You, you don't control. When, if you think about it, because I was thinking about this while you were presenting, it's God's people decided to be um, rebellious. So God took his protection away and then the king of the north came in. He knew who was there and who was going to come up against them. He just took his protection away. I think the same thing, Satan took his protection away from his kingdom. But I think it, well, I think it might have still been something because I think it's interesting. God uses the, the false king of the north to go up against his kingdom. But Satan can't allow God's people to come against his kingdom. He can't do that. That's just not in him to let God's people win over his people. He has to use an independent agent like the king of the south because he can't. That's, but when you don't choose God, you do choose Satan. So God can let Satan do what he wants to his people. Hmm. I don't know, but um, that's the only way I can see it. Because if the King of the South is a, is an, is a what did she call it like an independent ministry? Yeah. Then it's it's more of a spiritual thing where they're removing their protection from their their chosen people. Yeah. So. And I think God God allows that independent ministry to do its work because it is what ends up um, holding back satan's kingdom so it's there for a reason it's not morally useful to anyone they're just kind of there but they're there to be used when need needed mm -hmm. so it's interesting how it all plays out because there's always a king of the south it's never missing uh, unless it's for a very short period of time Is someone else talking there? No, oh, I, I was talking to myself. Let me close my mic. <laughs> no. Just a quick question. The yep. Crusades mm -hmm. and the Muslims coming against the papacy. Yeah. So that would have been Satan's kingdom. The no, nope. because remember she said that the king of the south, uh, that Islam doesn't fall into the statue either, the king of the north. So would it be, it, they would be another independent ministry. Right. But, That's what I was just going to say. So the, the king of the north being the papacy, the ones behind the crusades. Yeah. And the independent ministry. But I thought there was a spirit of prophecy quote somewhere. <laughs> this goes back years, but uh, where Sister White had, had said that God used the, the Muslims to, to punish the professing Christians, like the papacy. They use, they both use different independent nations. That's what the independent ones are there for, to be used. It might be in the spirit of prophecy, but Daniel or Uriah Smith says that it's a false. God used a, it was a false religion brought that brought a scourge against an apostate church. Ah, uh, okay, Elaine. God, God has his, God has used Islam. God has used Islam to preserve the scriptures also in the East. True, Kelly. Yeah, good point. Okay, so I might be repeating something here, but I'll just start here. Uh, did God bring his own people against Israel? No. The statue, King of the North, are a separate entity, and he uses them. But does Satan bring his own people against Babylon? No, he brings the king of the south. He uses them, but they are not his people. So when we tell the story of a deadly wound and death, we can compare and contrast the king of the north and king of the south. But when we talk about apostasy and captivity, we have to use a different parable because the king of the south cannot go into apostasy to a king they don't have. 
we have to talk about the true and the counterfeit. We have to talk about Israel and Babylon. So Israel went into captivity for how many, how many years? Let's call this 530. Let's call this 538. Where is she going here? Okay. So captivity is 530. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. Um, my phone, um, my internet is acting up. So hopefully this will get through. But it's based on the slide that's already up on the screen. So we know that both um, for God's kingdom and for Satan's um, kingdom, that they both use, um, I should say, I should, no, never mind, because I'm going to say that wrong. But God uses the king of the north to um, take captive his people when they're rebelling, rebelling. And then Satan uses um, the king of the south to take his people into captivity when they rebel. But at the end, God's people are the one who conquers Babylon, or I should say, um, Satan's kingdom. So, what does that look? What does that mean? What does that look like? Because um, the United it, States is the king of the north, and it conquers the king of the south, and then we conquer the false king of the north because we're the true king of the north. So it's like a domino. And we're we're a line of success, so we don't go into apostasy. Yeah. Right, right. I know. I get that, but I'm just saying, if we are the ones, um, okay, if we are the ones, like according to the slide, as we know, if we're the, okay, if Satan's kingdom is taken in captivity and it's the king of the south that's doing it, right? So, where do what does it look like for? I know what it looks like, but I'm just saying, according to the lines that we have up here, if it's if it's um, if it's the king of the south that's taken over uh, Satan's kingdom when they rebel against um, him or or disobey, but at the end is God's kingdom who is conquering Satan's kingdom. If that makes sense, I can't. I don't know how to explain what's trying to go through my mind. Um, because it's not the king of the south that's conquering um, Satan's kingdom at the end, if that makes sense. No, because um, it's no. the final. It's the final battle. It's the final battle between the true and the counterfeit. There's there's no more flim because the king of the south isn't a decent punishment for the papacy. It's only oh. like a half pint. When God comes up against the counterfeit and completely destroys it, it's going to be the final destruction. What the King of the South does is restrain. It doesn't completely. Oh, destroy. okay, okay, all right, okay, I got I, it. I don't know if this helps too. Is when we're looking at what's happening in the end, the United States and the papacy are the King of the North. They're fulfilling their job function for Satan. So the King of the South gets wiped out, and and Satan takes his um, kingdom as far as it can go against god's kingdom but they lose oh right okay yeah that does mean to and so it's like head on so it's like head on so it is the final okay got so it both, right. both kingdoms are fulfilling their job function in the end right so there's no oh. one yeah okay got it Thanks. okay um okay so we're going to call the captivity of god's kingdom up here um 538 and how many years did they go into captivity for they went into captivity for 1260 years and that brings us to 1798. And they came up as modern Israel in that time. And so Babylon, 1798, they go into captivity. Down here. Yeah, question mark. Uh, they go into captivity and they're going to resurrect and they're going to come up as modern Babylon in the end. When modern Israel comes out, of captivity, how many histories does it does it come in? It comes in two. There's an alpha and an omega of modern Israel, Millerite history and, and the 144,000 history. So there's an alpha and omega of modern Israel and then compare and contrast, what must there be for Babylon? There's an alpha and omega for Babylon as well. <clears throat> okay. So, after 1798, after the captivity of the papacy, when they come back into history, you must see them in two parts. You must see them in two parts as an alpha and omega. 
Mm, not there yet. Um, lost my spot. You must see them in two parts as an alpha and omega. What brings modern Israel out of captivity in 1798? Prophecy. And what type of prophecy? What brings Israel out of captivity? And I've already revealed that. It's the three-step prophetic testing message that's found in Revelation 14. Um, so what brings us out is a three-step prophetic testing message. And that three-step uh, message is, does anyone know what it is? Give the three. Fear God, give him glory. Ah, you did the transcript. I'm sorry. <laughs> Fear God, give glory, and judgment. And that's the first angel's message. Okay, so the king of the, uh, king of the north is a counterfeit of the king of the north, if you understand what I mean. So Satan's king of the north is a counterfeit of God's king of the north. And what brings modern Babylon out of captivity? The same thing, a three-step prophetic testing message. Parable teaching gives you a firm platform to accept truth when you are relatively new to this message. You can see just through, a par just through parable teaching, you can see that a resurrection of the king of the south, the fact that it comes, comes back after 1991, and compare and contrast, you can also see the... It's just so weird the way she talks. Um, you can also see that the see the importance of world war ii history when does babylon get their three-step prophetic testing message anyone but adriana does anyone know when when babylon gets their three-step prophetic testing message 1917 and what was that with fatima fatima okay so what is the first secret the children are given and uh, Fear God. Fear, the, fear, fear, fear Satan. Fear Satan. So the first thing that they see is the ground open up, and they're given a vision of an eternally burning hell, and they're terrified. Fear Satan. What is the third Church. message that they're given? Did someone say something? Judgment. The judgment. Judgment. So they are shown a vision of the Catholic clergy, clergy led up a mountain and then assassinated. And what is that? They understand it as a message of judgment. So how do you give, so what is the second message? Or how do you give Satan glory? By doing his... Oh, the consecration of Russia. Yeah. The consecration. I was going to say that. Yeah. Okay, someone has to explain <laughs> that to me because I wasn't picking it up when I was doing it. What, how is that getting? Well, I mean, I just see it as in um, that they're being, oh, how can I put it? Um, and following through with what Satan's order does, giving him glory, if that makes sense. I don't know. It's the same thing as in when God uses us and we are fulfilling his will, that gives him glory. Because if you think about it, our message, right? We have to give a message. That's how we glorify God. And the message is to turn to God and do what he wants, which is. So how is people. Russia? But what is Russia coming? Because that think Russia, to take down Russia? Russia is a country that will not allow the Roman Catholic Church for those people. Those people are not allowed because Christian Orthodox, the Eastern, the one that they've been always at war with, the East and the Western Church. So they don't allow Roman Catholicism in there. So they're trying to, um, what is it, consecrate Russia so that they can get Roman Catholicism in there. The whole point, they want to get their message to those people. Just like we have to give our message to the world. They, they don't have the message. We have to get our message to them. 
Russia wants to bring in Roman Catholicism? Is that what you said? No, no. R- Russia doesn't want to bring in Roman right. Catholicism. But that's what I don't understand is how is that getting... The papacy go- needs, the papacy. Satan wants the papacy to get Roman Catholicism into Russia. That's why the papacy unites with Hitler to get into Russia. They wanted, as soon as they had Hitler go into Russia, they had this idea and they pro- pro- they posed it to Hitler. They said, we want to follow in immediately with an army of clergymen to go and um, what is it convert all the people to Roman Catholicism and Hitler said no way are am I ever the day I'm gonna let you do that is the day I'm gonna let all the religions do that so you can beat each other to death with your crucifixes he didn't go for it so but their their plan was as soon as Hitler got in there they were gonna follow up with their mass conversion of Russia to Roman Catholicism so the giving of glory to to Satan is by Satan conquering this this last kind of um, religious stronghold. Yeah, his, 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 people ha- his people have to take his message to Russia, just like God's people have to take God's message to the world. That's how you glorify him. You tell them, hey, glorify God because he's the true God world. You haven't been paying attention to God. Give glory to God. Satan is, wants to go into Russia with his people and say, hey, glorify Satan. You haven't been doing that. You need to do that. He's, you know, go Satan. Well, not, they, they say it as a counterfeit, obviously, but you know what I'm saying. Okay, it makes a little more sense. Yeah. I'm sure I'll have more questions later, but... Um, so, uh, and the notes say, so how do, you give, how do you give Satan glory? What are they asked to do? Russia, the king of the south. If you were to go to Revelation, it says that before the birth of Christ, the dragon was ready to devour the child. Before its birth, it's already positioned itself to devour the child, um, and what year is this? 1917. And what is happening in Russia in 1917? The Bolshevik Revolution. The Bolsheviks don't take power until November. This begins about March and ends in October. Before the Bolsheviks and Lenin have even taken over Russia, the dragon is already ready to devour the child before it's born. It's a repeating history. They have a three-step prophetic testing message designed to bring them out of the state of captivity. What does this three-step prophetic testing message uh, give? The notes don't make sense there. What does this three-step prophetic testing message give them their job function to not go to... (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I think I've got to figure it out. Hold on, keep reading so I can figure out what happened. I I, I think I have it, so, okay. Is it really written like that? Yeah, it's probably what she said, but she she kind of pauses and then, and when you're, yeah, anyway. So, it's probably like, how does this three-step prophetic testing message give them their job function to not go to the leadership of Rome in the Catholic Church? Why doesn't it go to the Pope and the Vatican? Why hasn't the message itself gone to Rome? Because they are in apostasy to their boss. And when you're in apostasy to your boss, what does God do? He bypasses the leadership and he finds someone else. It's supposed to be why. Yeah, that's what I figured. Yeah. Or why, yeah. Why does this, okay. Um, and when you're in apostasy to your boss, what does God do? He bypasses the leadership and he finds someone else, whether it's the shepherds on the hill or Willie Miller or John the Baptist or Elder Jeff, he is going to find someone else. So for the counterfeit, when he was, when he has to bring his church out of a state of captivity, he finds he cannot go to the leadership. The morality doesn't matter. So he finds three children in Millerite history. How many people were given visions? She doesn't answer the question, but does anyone have an answer? It's three. I think she does. No, she? I say three. Hiram Medson, Ellen White, and William Miller. Is that right? Uh, no. Foy. Yeah. William Foy. Hazen Foy. Foy. Oh, Foss and Foy and, and Ellen uh-huh. White. Yeah. Visions. Oh, was vision. it? Well, Miller, had, Miller had the dream. That's right. It was a but Hiram Medson had a vision when they came out of the barn on October 23rd in Cornfield. I think she means the people who were given the the visions particular to like it was supposed to be a long term 
thing. Like it was with uh, Lucia and the kids. It happened multiple times. It right. was like to establish a doctrine kind of a thing, I think. Okay, so. If so, Freud, he, 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 he didn't want to do it. So he moved, she moved it to the next person. Yeah. So she says, Millerite history. How many people were given visions? The answer is three. And how many went through? One. How many of the children of Fatima were given visions? All three. And how many go through? One. Three children are given visions, visions and two died, one in 1919 and the other in 1921. She goes through and she's a prophet for the Catholic Church for the next about 80 years. We're going to come back and look at that history of 1917 and what the Alpha, Omega, Alpha and Omega can teach us. And that's yeah, the end. Yay! Nice and like that, and she never ends with... A real conclusion. How do you spell that, that Bolzvik? How do you spell that? B-O-L-S-H-E-V-I-K. B-O-L-S-H-E-V-I-K. Okay. That's close. I didn't know either. I had to Google it. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, are you going to put up the notes in, the, in those charts? <laughs> Yes. Someday. It doesn't Eventually. matter when. Just yeah, it, won't be, it won't be for maybe in, um, I don't know. I it doesn't on. matter as long as they could get up there because then they could go in, in the, the binders we're making. Yeah, they're, they're, they'll get out. Um, I just need to get everything caught up and I've been working a lot lately. Yeah. So um, they will get done. They're, pretty, they're practically done. I just want to organize them so they're more readable. Well, I made notes on all of them. So, I mean, I do have notes, but. I could have missed a lot. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it. If anyone has any questions in regards to any of that stuff. Um, well, that's good. I thought it was, it was really helpful to uh, go through. I, I still lack in under fully being able to put it in my mind, the, the two lines of virus, but you put some things in place that kind of help that click in a little bit more things I've seen, but they don't, you know, you're one piece at a time for me anyways. Yeah, same here, one so piece at a time. I got a little bit more, but I know that as we go forward in the classes that we're doing on the Sabbath, we'll get into that. So prayerfully, I'm worried that stuff that we've already been through isn't stuck in my mind. I, yeah, you know, pieces of it are there and it comes up in recall sometimes, but, um, but it is a lot of information. But the more we handle these truths, the, the stronger we're going to get in understanding it. Mm -hmm. And the easier it is going to be to share it as we understand it. And the thing is, we have to be, we have to be going over this stuff and being established in this stuff because it's not going to be repeated in the upcoming presentations. And we also, I mean, judging by the one video that I watched that we were discussing earlier, the new ones that Tess is coming out, where is that in France? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of new information that's going to come out. And I find that Parmenter's, Carpenter's message, which I don't watch as many of, and I and I regret it because I'm just it's so hard. But I'm getting, I'm starting to get what he's saying more now. I, I really had a difficult time with him. What I'm finding is that the two other messages were like two different things, and now they've come and they've overlapped. Because when you're listening listening to either one of them, it seems like they're starting to say, it's starting to sound more and more like the same thing that they're saying. Yeah. They're both saying how you read. How you read is the issue. That's what it boils down to. Yeah. We have to learn all. I mean, if if there's anything that we're if if anyone's wondering what we're doing right now, we're learning how to read. That's all we're doing. They're just giving us examples. They're they're drawing out, com, uh, comparing and contrasting for us. And these are important ones, obviously that you know that they're drawing out. But the whole point is just to teach us how to do that. Yeah. To show us that it is true and it works. We thought we were in college, but we're actually in grade school. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, in one of the uh, French ones of the three, it actually, it may even have been the Q&A uh, video. I think it's Sister Alyssa makes a, a comment and she basically sort of wraps it up and says, 
what she believes Sister Tess is getting us to do is to really think. Yes. Not so much, you know, and, and she makes a comment. It's, it's not so, so much about pants. She said it's not about pants. It's getting us to really think. I agree. And I think, and she was, I mean, as soon as she started talking, it was like, wow, that's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. I know myself, I have felt on a couple of different points, and this just being the more recent one, that it, it's like God is taking his people back over the same ground. Mm -hmm. For example, I'm thinking back now to, you know, 30 years back, a lot of the dialogue, what was going on was about the nature of sin, the nature of man, perfectionism, et cetera, et cetera, just as this movement was rising up. That was, that was what a lot of the dialogue was on. And sure enough, here last year, what are we all going over again and nailing down? And it's like that with many different aspects, I, I think, of, of truth that God has had to bring us back over it and unlearn and relearn. And, and I think this is what is going to end up being about dress reform, sexism, and so on. That we just, Jonathan, your advice was well taken earlier. You know, just be patient. Don't jump too quickly. You know, we need to really listen and learn to read properly and just wait and let God really settle everything, you know, in our own minds individually. And that's true because I've watched over the last several years with, with Parminder, there are many that, that don't like things that he says, and then they won't listen through to hear where he's actually going and why he's saying what he's saying. And they miss yeah. a lot. So patience in 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 going through it and giving it time to work its through work its way through and you know and along with your own studies and and God designed it this way to I it's part of our test to design it this way that um we have to strive. We have I think to the strive. I think the opposite can happen too because some people might hear what's being said and they say you know, a light bulb goes off and they say, I get it now. And then they run with it and they haven't listened to everything yet. Yes. So I, this is why I really, I've, I've been kind of saying it for a while is that, I mean, and I don't know how it all works. I know the Levites, we have a time when we go to them, but we can't be bringing an, an incomplete message to them. We have to sit and be the students right now. And in that presentation that she just did, the one that I just did, and she shows the line of Christ and their close of probation was at the cross. And then she, she goes on to point out that they, they still didn't go to the church. They had some work. They still had some work to work out. They had to go into the upper room and sort things out after their close of probation. So before they brought a complete message to the church, that's when Pentecost happened. So I think that we, there's two sides to it. You can stop listening because you don't like what they're saying and you'll walk away from the message or you're listening to a part of it and you're running with it before it's even been completed because we have a lot of learning to do. And it's, it's not a, an outward work. It's not an outward message. It's an inward message. It's teaching me more and more about myself and the things that like when I listened to that video from Tess this morning, I mean, I, I walked away feeling like I'm, I need to be humbled again in a way that's not going to be comfortable. And I'm not looking forward to it because I felt like I was traveling with the message and saying, Hey, you know, like when she came to Canada and saying, Hey, there's some things here that she's making a good point. Uh, you know, I got to look to myself and say, you know, where am I being sexist? And where am I being, you know, where is there maybe some racism in my understanding or, you know, like unfair judgment or whatever it is. And I was happy with it, you know, even though I realized that it was kind of rubbing against maybe my own natural ways, but the message isn't complete yet. And it's going to get, 
I, for lack of a better word, it's going to get harsher on us because God is humbling his people right now. Yes. Closer and closer and closer. And those yeah. that will go through this process will, will be among the, the wise and be among the 144,000. That's why I say yeah. when it comes to the, what's going on with the pants and all that, it, we have to be very careful in how we handle that. Yeah. It, that um, because it is a, some of you have been around longer than I have been. It's a, and they, and you've seen it more often, but it's a separation point that is happening. And we yeah. need to see that for what it is. And, and, and to be among the, you know, going back and forth, there's, there's people that I know um, that I'll be praying about that maybe among those that will refuse to, um, I'm not saying anybody's forcing anybody to wear pants. That's not the issue. It's about equality. But by not stepping up and seeing it as the issue that it is about equality, if they stay down at that lower rung and see it as, you know, God says we're supposed to wear skirts. We're, you know, this, that, and Sister White says this, and you know, they're gonna, they're gonna really struggle um, it, seeing the equality because what's getting in the way is what they previously learned, and uh, so then there's going to be those that are going to go the complete opposite that are just going to jump at the freedom to go put pants back on and they're going to miss the point of this prophetic test as well so i think we'd all be safe if we're praying and encouraging one another and praying for wisdom plead with the lord for the wisdom to go through this test on the right side and mm -hmm. we can't fail when we do that when we recognize that this is what this is what it is it's a dividing point it's the lord separating out and we have to strive so anyways that's yeah i agree adriana has um as we go forward i think it's going to get clearer because that's how it always happens. Yep. It's really jolting at first and everyone's like, wait, what's going on? What's happening? And then as it goes on, it becomes clearer and clearer. Yep. And also I think what, what I've been noticing is God is trying to dispel this weird religious um, superstition that we have that's been packed on over the ages, like not superstition in the conventional sense, but a foggy understanding of our own belief system. It's not clear and it's not consistent. We haven't been consistent with how we address every issue. And I think the point is God is trying to make us for our own sake so that we don't look ridiculous when we go to talk to the world and look like we're contradicting ourselves. He's trying to get us to be very accurate and good gospel workers. And to do that, we need to be able to read and apply consistently everything in the Bible. And that's what we have not been doing. And that's what this test is. Yep. Yeah. All right. Would Would anyone like to say a closing prayer for us? I can pray. Thanks. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this amazing study that we were able to have tonight. We thank you for helping us to put these studies in clear, understandable ways and helping all of us to learn through these methods. We thank you for putting it on our heart to do all these, and we thank you for helping us to all consistently come together every few nights, Lord, so that we can study it and fellowship. We have an incredible group here, and you've guided us um, this whole time, and you've strengthened us. We ask that you continue to be with us as we are now experiencing an intense shaking that's going on through this whole movement. Be with your people wherever they are, Lord, and help us to let go of any preconceived notions any of us might have because we've been shown in our face that we all still have these things that we're struggling with. Lord, we thank you for always being faithful and guiding us and help us to continue to have uh, a spirit of, of uh, obedience so that even if we don't like it at first, as far as we keep going and listen to you and draw closer to you, you'll keep striving with us. Lord, I know I still struggle with different things in my life and, and I know I'm not the only one. Please be with us. Please continue to have mercy as you have and help us to go through this message all the way to the end. We ask a mighty blessing on tomorrow's meetings and everything we're going to learn. 
pour out your latter rain upon us and your grace also and um, help us to continue to grow in your message. We pray this in the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen. amen. There's one other thing I want to, I kept wanting to mention as well. We've talked about it before, but um, just real quick. As we continue to go through this process and each turn, taking a turn at teaching, I want to remind everybody of many things that we've read before. The danger of self-exaltation. The danger of complimenting somebody for a job well done. Um, and I really want us to think about this because we actually put people in harm's way. Um, when we compliment them for the work that they've done, you know, and a, and a thought, an analogy kind of went to my head. That's the way to say it. Bringing back the angels again into this story. Do the angels go around high fiving each other for the job they've done? Would we ever see angels doing that? So remember that because both sides, the recipient and the one that's giving the praise or the, the or such. Remember, there is no glory in anything that we do. It's all the Lord. We're here because of the Lord. We're able to understand because of the Lord. We're able to share it because of the Lord. And we need to always remind each other of that and that all glory goes to him. Any skills that we have that allow us to do these presentations are skills that he has given us along the way. I look at my own, the work that I do. I know that he called me in to do the work that I do um, years ago. And, and it was him, though, that put me in that spot and him that put within me to be able to teach myself things. So, but it's all him and all praise and all glory must be to him. Because again, to be among the 144,000, we will be like the angels. And we will not go around high-fiving one another if that's a, I don't know if that's a right way to say it, but I thought that might be a way that we'd all understand it. So, any comments? Silence, I guess, huh? Sorry. Do you, do you still need a number nine presenter? Why? I agree, I agree 100%. It's not as... You know, I started taking, I started doing the, um, the, I got, I'm 45 minutes into um, dictating the notes into typing. I thought maybe I'd try and do it if no, because nobody else has ever stepped up to it yet and it was coming down to the wire. Why? Do you want to do um, that one as well? Because you said you couldn't do that one. Uh, yeah, I, it's going to be on a Wednesday and that falls on when I'm probably going to be like trying to dash through traffic, which never ends up well. So. Yeah, we don't want you to do that. Uh <sighs> I, I I started doing mine, but I was also um, watching what um, John was doing today so I could, you know, stay in touch. And then I realized that I'm typing out John's. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I started mine. So if anybody wants to step up. I'm, just, I'm not writing it on paper. I'm doing what you did, Adriana. What you suggested is just type it out as you hear it. And pausing, so. And you can slow down the video. Yeah, I already know that. Yeah. Doesn't I'm, that help a lot? Yeah, it does. It I, haven't, I haven't done it yet, but when I'm doing the translated ones, it's a lot easier. But last night, I sat down and I, I messaged John last night. I think he jumped off already. I messaged him because, uh, man, she was doing a 12-minute recap of stuff. Bam, 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 bam. And I thought... Well, that was a bad thing to do right before you get ready to go to bed because I felt like I just ran a marathon. <laughs> I'm trying right. to keep up with it. And uh, so I'm about 45 minutes into um, getting the notes dictated and then I'll just slow down the video to, um, to do the notes. But if anybody wants to step up and take number nine, feel free. If not, I'm going forward with it. Yeah, no, I, I have 11. I'm going to do 11, so... But who, but right before we got on, um, Christine or some, um, Adriana, you have a tutorial of how to um, do it in a mic? Yeah, that's the Google Docs thing. Do you have a Gmail account? Yes. 
Okay, so if you just stay signed into google.com or you have a Gmail, you can go to Google Docs. Okay. Search Google, just follow that tutorial. I have, I have Google Docs. Yeah, go to Google Docs and under tools, it has voice typing. Okay. And then you click on the microphone yep. to talk and it records it while it's red and then you click on it again to stop it and it'll turn black and that's it. I'll walk okay. you through it again, Tony. I'll walk you through it again. Yeah, I think I get it. I'll try it first because it sounds okay. Um, I also have a Dragon Dictate, which I got my sister a long time ago. So I'm going to uh, try to set that up too because that's even more precise. If I speak it out, I won't be making mistakes. Yeah, that's that's yeah. probably better quality. Cause but yeah, I'm going to try it all that. It does require editing. I don't know if the, the what you're talking about does or not, but it does require editing. Um, to to go through because some things don't transcribe quite right yeah well if i set this up i just have to say period or comma it'll do everything it takes all of, all the commands yeah and it's 99 percent accurate oh praise the lord yeah so it's just get me to install it <laughs> yeah i found what works for me that might work different for everybody but what works best for me is to just go through the transcribing process um you know, kind of quickly, you have to stop here and there kind of quickly. And then when I go back to um, edit it, I put it in a Word doc and, and go back and do my editing and build it all at the same time. And then I can play it back slower. And then I'm, I'm learning it as I'm doing that more so than when I'm dictating it, especially when you're listening to a 200 mile an hour. So you're typing as she's talking. No, I'm talking yep. it in. I have my head. Oh, you're out. talking it in. Okay. And I'm talking it in and it's typing. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. But you have to use two different items. Like you have to use a phone and a computer or two phones to do that. Yeah. I use, I actually use, I actually use my computer and I just put my headphones into my computer so that I have the video on the right side of the screen and I have my notes on the second side or you know the Google Docs on the second on the left side of the screen or you can do it however you want and then that way I can pause the video if I need to 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 back up or something so, but so I have you have, it, you have it both on the same computer because I can't it won't do that for me with your headphones yeah it won't yeah, it shut when it, um, it shuts off the um, the the video every time I try to talk to the Google Docs. Yeah, it's kind of funny because on my computers that I have in the office, I have one that I use for an old one that I use for all the ministry and the DVDs, and then my one that I work on. Neither one of them, when I talk into it, regardless, plugged into anything else or just talking into it, neither one of them work. I don't know why. And then when I, this new laptop though, it works. I'm um, praise the Lord. <laughs> wow. Okay. Awesome. Do, are you putting the headphones in the headphone jack or the mic jack? Maybe that's something that's going on there. Oh. Yeah, that could be. There's only one jack. Oh, there should be two. Yeah. Okay. What? Did you say my name? Uh, no, um, because, um, um, on my heads, I have a lot of different headsets with the microphones on them, but the ones with the Dragon Dict, I only have like one headset, so I'm gonna have to get an adapter because it has two prongs, and I'm gonna have to get one that has one and then goes, well, a Y that will go into my computer. Okay. But your computer should have both. Both. Yeah, I just have one. I just have one headset. It looks like. And that's pretty messed up because this is like a thousand dollar computer, but it's got it all a long time ago. What what computer is it? Is it an Apple or a PC? No, it's just a Hewlett Packard. Uh, okay, a PC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. On the back of the tower, you know the big heavy tower box thing. Do you have one of those? No. No. Oh, it doesn't have that. No, this is just a laptop. Oh, it's a laptop. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so you okay? You already have one. Okay. Oh, okay. So, um, seems like I had something else I needed to mention. Oh, I wanted to ask uh, Adriana, are you, um, did, are you not at home or something? I am, but I'm in my room hunkered down with the headphones. I can go check. What do you want me to find? 
or whether or not I left the um, Acts of the Apostles um, chapter eight there. I'm pretty sure I left them at your house just to be on the table for next time. Are there mult? So there should be multiple of them. Yeah, because they're not in my they're not in my bag or with my stuff. I think I left them there. Let me check. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay. Then now my question is because you probably guys gave me the answer earlier. You were talking about a DVD that she wrote about that John was talking about. So where do I go for that? A DVD what? France? Was it a France one or what? Oh, I would say the one that she was talking about. Talk about the questions and answers. The questions. And I guess there's three of them. Oh yeah, well, they're in the email from they're they're all in the email from uh, Wednesday night's audio oh, okay. link. You go in there and they're in there. There's three video links um, that take you to the France School of the Prophets, and they're talking okay. about pants and equality. Um, okay. Correct. Yeah. But, but was was talking, I want to hear the one about the uh, the vi vac vaccinations. Oh, right. That's the one, one in number 42. Christina was talking about there's a question and answer one. And I right. think she said it was uh, number 42. That's going to be hard for a lot of us then. If yeah, there's other places she talks about the vaccines. I don't remember which one. So kind of like, give me a, like a little bit of what she means about it. She goes, in, well, she goes into quite, quite the depth about, um, about the, the originally when vaccines came out and how they saved millions of lives and she goes into some of that stuff, how they right. save millions of lives and that uh that basically the whole vaccine thing is conspiracy theories that too is a test in this movement as well that people are challenged on wow so yeah. they're we should they're, be so they're not, all, it should be not mercury and all that then it, it should be that we're all old enough that we've had our vaccines anyways so it's not an issue with us uh, if, if, unless we're going to have children and not vaccinate them. And anybody's going to have children at this point in time. And, Some uh, vaccines what have a shelf life of like five years or so, like the B vaccine, and so you'll have to get revaccinated. So some of them. Well, what about the I flu? I don't know if I've ever been back. Well, of course, when I was a baby, but other than that. Are we mean? supposed to get the flu Which vaccine, one, Adriana? I, huh? Are they there? No. I'm not seeing them anywhere. I don't know if my mom moved them. I can't ask him. She went to sleep, so I don't know where they are. I don't see any. Okay, I'll print them. I know I printed them for everybody um, because I came with uh, the one that we were currently on and then the next one, which was chapter eight. So Are they in your suitcase? I looked. They're not. I don't have them. That's why I, I was pretty sure that I brought them and then um, left them there. Yeah, I don't know if my mom moved them. I don't know where she moved them, and I can't. She went to sleep, so I can't. Okay. Christine has a uh, question. Are we supposed to get the flu vaccine once a year? I'm not going there. I don't know that. that I don't know if that's. I don't know. Are we not supposed to say no until we like? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Hear it all about it, because I'm not either. But I guess if I hear it, and I'm just, and then I don't recall her mentioning. Um, I don't recall her talking about the flu vaccination. I, I mean, because I won't even do the mammograms. I haven't done those in years. There's a lot of things I haven't done because we heard all these things. Yeah. You know? Well, I'm going to stick to a lot of the stuff that we're already dealing with. In, in, uh, not we're not supposed to get mammograms? It's not that. It's just no. mammograms. They're, they're radiation and they're not good for your breasts and things like that. They, they came out with a different machine now, I hear, and, and it's a lot safer and it's, it's not a, it doesn't hurt as bad. But, you know, back in the day, well, still, not back in the day. It's just that, yeah, it was bad, the, 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 the testing, whatever, pressing against you and the, 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 I guess they take a picture or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I I, Christy, Christine, I don't think that I have not heard her say anything about that was something that Tony said just because I am and I'm not saying anything against Tony at all but I don't know that I heard her mention mammograms it was just right oh no I'm not saying yeah I'm not no, saying she did I'm just saying no I, know. I was just I just yeah. didn't want her to think that that Tess had said I don't that. think she did she was just right now yeah okay no. just part of the discussion as well mm -hmm. right. We're having to learn, off, relearn a lot of stuff, unlearn and relearn a lot of stuff. That's yeah. what it comes down to. Right. It's going to take discernment. And, and if we want to be among the 144,000, we will go with patience through these things and, and, uh, 
and hear hear it all out and pray with pray you know that we would have the understanding we need because yeah we just have to be willing to accept anything the lord puts upon us we definitely need to know it comes from him and he will let us know you know i, I you gave us the uh, i think it is the um tahiti you gave us some mp3s uh-huh and I hadn't listened to them, and I had them in my car, and I didn't get to listen to all of it because um, um, there. Parmenter was talking about 9/11, that 9/11 isn't what we really thought 9/11 was. Say that again. Um, I I didn't get it all down, but this is what I got so far that he was talking about 9/11, and Sister White, when she wrote about 9/11, of course she didn't know what. You know, she didn't know what she was talking about. She never knew about the original 9-11. And then he was going on to say that that what we thought about 9-11, it's, it's not that. And then I got out of the car. So I got to go through it. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> so, oh, talking about Revelation 18 being 9-11. Yeah, but 9-11, what we think about the buildings coming down is not what it actually um, is that's what I got so far. So I'm gonna watch it and then I'll or listen to it and then I'll. Um, I've heard him know. cover that in um, other places, but you know what I have never heard him say is what it. If it's not that, then what was she talking about? Yeah, I did. I, yeah, I didn't get that far, but um, I'm gonna listen to all of it probably Sunday. Being that tomorrow's gonna be Sabbath, and we're gonna well, be doing. I'm a lot. gonna log off and get myself to sleep here pretty soon or maybe re get victoria leave i think so yeah a long time ago okay she, right. tony she was having really bad internet connections oh, anyways right. so I'll, I'll, tomorrow will be better yeah and, I'll just go and on she's gonna she's gonna talk about it tomorrow anyways okay, talk about awesome, it yeah. awesome adriana what yeah um, you do have unlimited data right yeah Okay, because I was talking to John, the other John, the John that lives here, <laughs> that looks like the other John in Canada. So, yeah. Okay. Um, he was, I was asking him about the internet, what we're looking at, and you can get a, a, I can't remember what he called it, not a booster, he didn't call it a booster, but where you broaden your range on your, on your cell service. I, I can't remember what you called it. Your Verizon, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So I can look into it if you want. But you're the one that has unlimited. I don't. And uh, so anybody else that might have unlimited that, that wants to try and do it. but And we'll pay for it out of the ministry, whatever it may cost. And I think if you can just do it a temporary thing, then we'd be able to do from your phone then, right? Yeah, we can we can try it. What it does is it increases your your range. Like say most of them are like three mile radius from a tower. It can expand your range out to ten miles or whatever, um, so that so that you're picking up signal from towers further away. Did he call it a hotspot? He did talk about hotspots, and I said there's no internet there at all. So I don't know if it was merged as being uh, the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that, that what we could do is check with Verizon. They'll know what it is. I can't remember what he called it. It wasn't like a booster, I don't think. I don't think it was called a booster. I can't remember. But anyways, it widens your range to um, to to where he said he, there's people that take their out on mountain roads where they take and go do off-road riding and such. Are you guys all still there? Yeah. Okay. My screen just kind of went back to, I don't know why it does that. Um, so, so anyways, we can look into that and the, we can pay for it out of the ministry. So I think I found it. Cool. It's a Sabbath. Don't do it tonight. Okay. Well, you can, if you want, but I wouldn't, um, maybe we shouldn't have talked about it either. I, I didn't think about it that way. Um, but, but anyway, so just, uh, something to think about for rescue and maybe cottonwood too. Okie doke. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and exit out of here. I'll go ahead and print the Acts of the Apostles ones, and I don't know if Robert contacted you. Did Robert get your address? Me? Adriana. 
I don't know if he, did you give him my number or my mom's? I don't remember if I did or not. I just, he just said that he was going to be coming. So, um, yeah, no one contacted me or anything. Well, no. back in Portola, nobody gave him the address. He might have asked your mom. I don't know. I don't know either. Okay. But yeah, he can come. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, I just hope he knows how to get here. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's why I, I, I don't know if he asked your mom or what, but I know he talked about it, and and uh, I'll make sure I text him. What? Let me let me write down the address real quick. Uh, I'll text it to you. <laughs> okay, sounds good. And then I can text forward it to him, because unless you have his number. I don't. Okay. Okay. John's internet cut off abruptly. <laughs> That's he just sent a message in his internet cut off. Okay, well I'm gonna close out and then I'll print that up and God bless you guys and good night, happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Good night, happy Sabbath.